3,000 subscribers. And oh, cool. 300,000 on a video for the first time ever. That was embarrassing. The Cartman impression. By that chick with an old lady name, not the achievements. Thanks a bunch, guys. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk. I'm here to talk to you about South Park. Or more specifically, the mothers of the town. So it seems as though South Park has found a home on my channel. And it just so happens I crossed two milestones several weeks ago. So time to kill several birds with one stone. Sorry, Star. Maybe one day. It's just really hard to articulate, okay? It's one for the ladies! In cartoons, it's a known fact that most parents aren't cut out to be parents, but social services has no funding, or they forgot to put their names in the phone book. This is especially true of adult cartoons, but listing all the examples would take up the entirety of this video. Sal Park, being on the air for 25 years, is no exception. And hey, unlike other adult cartoons, at least they had an episode acknowledging that foster parents exist, and said foster parents were probably worse than the real parents. Are there such things as angels? Maybe. Good! Ah! However, there are a few diamonds in the rough. Mrs. Mackey was able to talk her son out of causing World War III. Those times weren't better. We were all scared. People died. That's not something to strive to get back to. But at the same time, Tweak's parents caused him no shortage of paranoia by implying he'll be kidnapped by a stranger at any moment. You failed the test, son. Didn't I tell you not to open the door for anybody except your mother and I? What if that had been a child abductor pretending to be a police officer, Tweak? Got to be on your toes, Tweak. All right, now go to bed and get some rest. Night, pumpkin. Meanwhile, some have tried to be good moms. Like Harriet Biggle. Yet she didn't seem to notice her daughter harming herself and brushed it off as an improvement. Does she still seem better? Oh, much better! For South Park, most viewers point to the fathers as being the worst of the worst. But gals can fail in the parenting department too. So let's ask ourselves the question, who is the worst mom in South Park? Well, most people will point to Sheila Broflosky. She does have an entire song dedicated to her in D minor, and I did listen to it when I was writing the script. And she also had another song detailing her motives, which actually got nominated for an Oscar. Too bad it lost to Phil Collins. Okay then, let's discuss. Sheila, the mother of Ike and Kyle, is probably the most hated person in South Park, both in-universe and out. Think of her as the Jewish version of Maude Flanders and Helen Lovejoy, a negative Nancy who tries to instill good values onto the town, whether the townsfolk like it or not. Before Randy Marsh, she was the original Karen. For example, in the first Mr. Hankey episode, she disagreed with the idea of the school putting on a nativity play, especially the fact that Kyle, her Jewish son, is playing Joseph. Mr. Garrison, what the hell do you think you're doing? How dare you include the nativity in a school play? Don't you realize my son is Jewish? It eventually leads into the town trying their hardest to make Christmas as non-offensive as possible, taking down anything that even resembles Christmas. It's mistletoe offensive! Is anyone offended by mistletoe? Lose the mistletoe! Until we get this non-offensive train wreck. <laughs> what the hell is this? This is horrible! The blame for this is placed at Sheila's feet. Hey, you're the ones who made it this way. Yeah, it's because the Jews said it couldn't be Christian. It wasn't our idea to take out Santa Claus. But I'd argue, was it really her fault? Her only true complaint was she didn't think the town should have had a nativity scene. Like this comment right here. We are deeply offended by the nativity scene in front of the Capitol office. Church and state are separate. This was not Sheila. This was somebody else. Sheila didn't say they had to get rid of Christmas entirely. And honestly, I can kind of see her reasoning. The nativity scene is religious and it's a public school. True Christmas itself has its origins with religion, but for most people, there's a difference between Christmas, the religious holiday, and Christmas, the secular holiday, where you give gifts to people make cookies, or order Chinese food. Our family doesn't celebrate Christmas! <gasps> 
But at least you get to go to the movies on Christmas, Kyle. If the kids were putting on a Christmas play, like with Rudolph or Santa, and Sheila criticized that, then yeah, I'd argue she was going a little too far. If anything, it was the rest of the town misunderstanding her. Sheila even suggested Kyle could do something to represent Hanukkah. Kyle, is there anything you can do for a Christmas play that isn't related to Jesus? How about the dreidel song, Bubby? I'd also like to point out that part of her anger stemmed from Mr. Garrison insulting her and Kyle. See, that's what you get when you raise your child to be a pagan. Now that does it. I am going straight to the mayor about you, Mr. Oh, wait, Garrison. wait, wait. I'm sorry. Was it the pagan remark? I make this point because rewatching the Sheila-related episodes, I've noticed there's a common theme. She's pushy, but she usually has good intentions. The problem is she can't see beyond herself until it's too late. In Conjoined Fetus Lady, she thinks the boys are singling out Nurse Golem by making fun of her condition. And then she walked over to Kyle, the that is enough! I've been reading up on your poor nurse's condition and it is nothing to be made fun of. It's called Conjoined Twin Myslexia. Sheila tries to make her feel welcome, inviting her over to dinner to make up for what happened, and getting mad when she sees people make what she believes, Sheila, not Nurse Golem, to be microaggressions. I think our boys might just have the dead fetus to win. Heart! Gerald, keep your damn mouth shut! It's okay, Miss Breslovsky, really. Even if Nurse Golem tries to reassure her she doesn't have a problem with the boys, Sheila still persists, viewing her as a victim. I have felt so bad ever since I heard the boys making fun of you. They're just young boys. Joking is a way for them to come to terms with what they don't understand. She even convinces the mayor to create Conjoined Win Mislexia Week to try and break the stigma. Once again, she had good intentions, but by singling out somebody who didn't want it, all she did was make that person feel like a pariah. So when Nurse Golem tells the town off, Sheila doesn't even learn her lesson. Oh my, what an ungrateful- <laughs> Yeah, the nerve of some people. Plus, there's Def, where she doesn't want the boys watching Beavis and Butthead. I mean, South Park, I mean, Terrence and Philip. Stupid. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah, Philip. What? Okay, I get them confused. So she and the parents leave their children to go police the shows they watch. Death is here, and, and he's trying Whoa. to take us all away with him. Stanley, honey, you need to leave mommy alone. I'm doing something very, very important for your little well-being there. And she takes her crusade so far that the parents manage to get Terrence and Philip off the air by flinging themselves at the walls. We will not let these corporate halfwits ruin our children's minds. We will all follow suit one by one if that's what it takes. Honestly, I don't have anything else to say about it, besides it eventually became the basis for the movie. But the kids end up giving a pretty good speech about why they think moral guardians exist. I think that if parents would spend less time worrying about what their kids watch on TV and more time worrying about what's going on in their kids' lives, this world would be a much better place. I think that parents only get so offended by television because they rely on it as a babysitter and the sole educator of their kids. So, kudos. Also, Sheila gets Terrence and Philip replaced with She's the Sheriff, starring Suzanne Somers. And now back to She's the Sheriff. No! God, no! I know the boys hate it, but wouldn't they be, like, excited? I thought she used to do all those exercise videos. So I guess now we can talk about the infamous South Park movie. Bigger, longer, and uncut. Oh, I just got the title. As it features Sheila at her most diabolical. In spite of moral guardians, Terrence and Bella became so popular that they got their own movie. I think that happened several times in the 90s. Which the boys go to see behind their parents' backs. As a result, they start cursing and generally being disruptive, which causes them to get grounded and later punished at school, and causes Hungry Tiger Sheila to leave her cage. You Canadians are all the same! I find that racist! And our children are now addicted you to your- You are a racist, film. man! You are a racist! It is going to take us weeks to erase the damage this film has done to our children! Now yes, to whatever viewpoint you could give, Sheila is right the kids are copying what they saw. Because let's be honest, we all did that. But as a parent, it's also her responsibility to tell them, boys, what's on TV is funny, but not everybody else finds it funny. It's a cartoon. You can't repeat it and you cannot copy it. Or at the very least, it was her responsibility to watch them or bet the movie. Boys, what's this movie rated? Boys, what's the movie about? Give Jaren this. At least she asked Stan what kind of movie he was going to see. After watching the movie for what's likely the millionth time, the boys try to copy a stunt they saw. And it leads to Kenny's death. <laughs> 
Now, while the movie says Kenny's death is because he saw a movie he probably shouldn't, I disagree highly. Not that it didn't play a role, but the main blame, in my opinion, lies not with the movie, but with the doctors. The South Park doctors are incompetent AF. They couldn't even put a cap on a glue stick right. Who's making a potato? My bad, sir, I missed lunch. They replaced Kenny's heart with a potato and resuscitated him just to say he had three seconds to live. I have some bad news. We accidentally replaced your heart with a baked potato. You have about three seconds to live. What? Still, the parents have an epiphany. Canada is responsible, since that's where the movie originated. Kenny set himself on fire because he saw Terrence and Philip do it in that dirty movie. Ugh, they have a point. Haven't you ever watched YTV? To this end, they form MAC, or Mothers Against Canada, and demand the arrest of Terrence and Philip for corrupting the minds of America's youth. <laughs> Why? Dude, Kenny's parents could have gotten a lawsuit, or Mac could have filed a class action lawsuit, so everybody got some. Either way, y'all would have been set for life. Sucks they didn't try suing the hospital. I thought considering what happened to Kenny, they would have gotten a very generous settlement. Actually, maybe it's better they didn't try to sue. I'm sure as comedic geniuses, Terrence and Philip are well aware of the Chewbacca defense. I mean, they even teach it at law school nowadays. During the movie, Kyle's arc is learning to stand up to Sheila. As the war grows more and more out of control, the Baldwins are even killed in an airstrike. All the Baldwins are dead? But Sheila is unable to listen, losing sight of her original goal. You are grounded! Now get back to the house and stay there! You started a war, you have to stop it! To make them safe again! Hello? Our children are precious! Hello? We must make a stand now! Even demanding that they put chips into the minds of children to keep them from cursing. We will start putting these chips in all our children next week! Max demands change. Instead of wanting Terrence and Philip taken to court, they want them executed. It doesn't help that as Kenny's spirit relates to the boys, if said executions are successful, Satan will rise up and take over the world. In true South Park fashion, the war grows out of control as the American government starts rounding up Canadian citizens to send to happy camps, if you catch my draft. And since Ike is Canadian, Kyle has to hide him in the attic. We're gonna put an end to this. And then I'll make mom come home, and we'll all be a family again. Ugh, this is like nine seasons too early. Like if they just waited until that episode, Ike could have hung out with the neighborhood cats. The boys managed to free Terrence and Philip during a USO show, where their deaths are the grand finale, and they wind up on a battlefield. Realizing their actions were for naught, the rest of Mac calls it quits. This is what we wanted! We wanted our children to be brought up in a smut-free environment! But we didn't want this! Oh, but Sheila is just getting started. She manages to track Terrence and Philip down and hold a gun to their heads. But Kyle, for once in his life, stands up to her. Kyle! I'm not gonna let you kill them, Mom! What, what, what? I'm not moving! Good on you, kid. He even gives this speech which moves the crowd and even brings Sheila to heal. Whenever I get in trouble, you go off and blame everybody else. But I'm the one to blame. You keep going off and fighting all these causes, but I don't want a fighter. I want my mom. But it doesn't do any good. Oh! Good! The apocalypse happens, but big grand battle, yada, yada, yada. Good job, Ms. Blofowski. Thanks a lot. I was just trying to make the world a better place for children. Yeah, and you brought enough intolerance to the world to allow my coming. And everything is back to normal. Sheila realizes the error of her mistakes and is willing to tolerate Terrence and Philip. The end. Now, you might hate me for saying this, but I don't think Sheila is all that bad nowadays. What, what, what? Look, I will admit that at first, Sheila could be annoying, but over time, she has gotten better. If anything, Gerald is the worst parent. He used to be one of my favorite characters, but now I want him to suffer. Ever since I got to YouTube, the Troll Trace plotline hurts more. Sheila should have done way more than just peeing on him. As for Sheila herself, I feel like most of her bad moments happens either during the movie or pre-movie. Yeah, she did act like a monster in the Troll Trace arc, but it was either Gerald's doing or Kyle and Ike intentionally pushing her buttons to get a reaction out of her. 
maybe she really is trying to be a better person, or maybe Matt and Trey just couldn't find another use for her, but she ended up playing a massively reduced role as time went on. And because of that, she has gotten better. She has good moments, but they often get overshadowed by her bad qualities. But most bad parents in cartoons, they might love their children, but only deep down. Or when push comes to shove. And I'd say Sheila does love Ike and Kyle, because everything she does is for them. When Kyle found out Ike was adopted, Sheila and Gerald tried to tell him that even if Ike didn't share any blood with them, he was still a member of their family. Ike wasn't really your brother, he was adopted. What? He was not really a Braslovsky, he was Canadian. But we loved him all the same. <laughs> Ike and Kyle fear Sheila, but they know that she would do anything for them. When Ike was forced back to Canada by the new Prime Minister, Sheila was devastated. I have some chocolate. CHOCOLATE! But like always, she's too pushy and can occasionally be a smother. In Cherokee hair tampons, Kyle is sick and needs a kidney transplant. But Sheila is convinced by misinformation, literally, run by this fascinating woman named Misinformation. Oh, well, with a name like Misinformation, she must know something. To try holistic medicine, not realizing it's killing Kyle. And his aura is lighter. Oh, that's great news. Yeah. Oh, no. No, no, that's good. Part of it stems from her naivety and her fear, as she doesn't want to see Kyle in a hospital hooked up to wires. I don't know what to do, Sharon. They want to have him go into surgery, but that's so dangerous. When she's set straight, she helps Kyle get the kidney he desperately needs from Cartman. In Cartman land, Kyle has an infective hemorrhoid, <gasps> and because of his crisis of fate, the hemorrhoid becomes terminal. Sheila tries to help Kyle by telling him the story of Job and how he went through lots of of suffering, but stayed true to his faith. That's the most horrible story I've ever heard. Why would God do such horrible things to a good person just to prove a point to Satan? Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay, Sheila, maybe you should have told him the ending where Job was rewarded for his stubbornness. Like the fact he got more kids. Because, you know, kids are like Funko Pops. I think one of my favorite Sheila episodes is It's a Jersey Thing. As a result of MTV's Jersey Shore, more Jersey people are moving to South Park. Poor Sharon! Doesn't she know? Know what, ma? Huh? Never invite a New Jersey housewife into your home. And trust me, as a New Jersey resident, I feel the pain. Most people here hate that show, or we view it as a fad we can't believe we used to like. After an altercation at the hairdresser, Sheila reveals the terrible truth. She was from Jersey. Sheila, who are you talking to? You wouldn't understand. It's a Jersey thing. <gasps> Actually, North Jersey. She claims to be from Newark. Your father and I were living with my parents in Newark. Liar. I was born and raised in the Brick City, even if I don't know a single person who actually calls it that. It's Nork with one syllable, like pork, poser. In Jersey, she was known as SWOW, I can't say that word on YouTube, and was a raging party gal. She tries to gently tell Kyle that after she found out she was pregnant, she wanted to give her son a normal life. So she and Gerald moved to South Park. And living in South Park, she is able to control the Jersey side of her, so long as she isn't around other people from Jersey. Let's go Tell everyone from Jersey we don't want them here! It won't work! You can't just tell people from Jersey you don't like them. No matter how obnoxious they are, they will convince themselves that you will actually think they're cool. But as Kyle was conceived in Jersey, he's got a teeny little bit of the Jersey blood in him. But now I realize, you can take the fetus out of Jersey, but you can't take Jersey out of the fetus. Oof. I wonder if he says Taylor Ham instead of pork roll. What I like about this episode is we get a side of Sheila we don't typically see. Sheila, unless you push her too far, is always known for being restrained. Even in the movie, she was the only parent who never swore. But if it's to help her friends and family, she'll do whatever it takes. Psych Psycho Psycho You wanna see crazy? You better just step the f away, you wanna see crazy? Sheila? Also, one complaint I do get the episode, I hate that we never got to see Gerald being a Jersey dude. I feel like it would have been hilarious if literally the entire Profloski household, with the exception of Ike, acted Jersey. An earlier episode mentioned Gerald was from South Park, but he did spend some years in Jersey, so maybe that Jersey stink is still attached to him. Then there's other good moments. After Mr. Garrison became Janet, the town did not know how to deal with it. Normally, you'd expect Sheila to throw a fit, especially back in 2005. 
alive, but she's surprisingly cool with it. And it's Gerald who has a problem, since he doesn't understand how you would explain that to your child. That does it! I'm taking you boys out of that school! Gerald, that is very close-minded of you! You shouldn't judge people who want to change. It's Sheila who explains it to Kyle, and in a way he fully comprehends. They feel like there's somebody trapped in another person's body. They can have a surgery that makes them more into the person they see themselves as. Do you understand? Totally! For all the flag the episode gets, I will admit, this moment does kind of save it for me. Now, there's other moments I could have chosen, but in conclusion, I don't think Sheila nowadays is truly the worst mom in South Park. Even when you compare her to somebody like Leanne, who was a bad parent but improved, she still raised both of her children right. But the video isn't over yet. With that out of the way, who is the worst mom in South Park? It's... 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 Linda Stotch. What? What? I know, I'm surprised too. Now, originally, this video was gonna be a roast for Sheila about just how much she sucks and why she sucks. But then I put a poll out to see what you guys thought. I'm not always correct. I can be wrong, and I like to see what people say. Linda actually beat out Sheila by a massive amount. So I went back and rewatched a couple of episodes, and you guys are right. Linda sucks. She sucks. She sucks a bag of rotten eggs. She sucks a bag of raw pork sausages. Think of her like Alador Blight from the Owl House. If Alador actively participated in the beatings, or was the lookout, and then afterwards, he took a swing at the kids. Anyhow, Linda is Butters' mama, and she's married to Steven, or Chris. There is no going back, Chris! Depends on the episode. Linda rises to prominence in Butters' very own episode, and one of my favorites. Butters can't wait for his parents' anniversary, as every year, the whole family goes to Bennigan's. You ever been to Bennigan's, mister? Oh, it sure is, great. I'm going to Bennigan's tomorrow night with my family. <sighs> Sucks I don't live near one. I would have wanted to go. The nearest one's in Ohio. Linda asks Butters to follow Steve and Chris around and see what he likes in order to think of good ideas for a gift. And oh boy, does Butters follow his daddy around. He finds Steve and Chris in a bathhouse, specifically the White Swallow, wrestling with a bunch of guys and watching WWE unrated in a movie theater. Butters, ever the oblivious scam, reports back to Linda. The only thing I can't figure out is why Dad told you he was going shopping for your present when he was going out seeing movies and wrestling. Oh, did you have a nice trip, Ma? See you next fall! <laughs> Which causes Linda to snap like a twig on the floor of a Walmart in the middle of Black Friday. I don't think Daddy's shopping. I think Daddy's going out wrestling again. Paint! Paint! Must be made clean! No. Linda has a mental breakdown. Oh, I had one of those. Those are fun. Painting the house three times over. Likely what it's best does. Wow, honey, you've painted the entire house. Three times. Must paint! Everything clean! Everything new! And lets herself go. She decides the only logical thing to do isn't to confront Steve and Chris, or hire Phoenix Wright to sue the pants off of him, but rather to kill Butters, since he was the one to tell her, and then kill herself. Must clean Butters. Never be clean. Must kill? The only way? Must kill Butters. That's right, you heard me. <laughs> She drives him out to the forest and gets out of the car while Butters is still in it, meaning to let him drown. Linda even gives this dark speech before she does it. Butters, if a mommy has to end her life, she can't let her baby alone in the world to be raised by a sick pervert. I'm going to get out of the car now, Butters. I want you to stay put with your seatbelt fastened. You couldn't even just poison him or put the pillow over his head? Give Sheila this, she never tried to kill her kids. True, the happy camps existed, but that's just the South Park government being a-holes like usual. Shh, it's okay, baby. Mommy will be with you very soon. <laughs> Of course, Butters is a main character, so he doesn't die. He ends up going downstream. Maybe, just life pro tip, when you want to murder somebody, you should stick around just to make sure it's actually successful. To top it off, he has to walk home on a super dark road and take a ride from a trucker. But Linda doesn't know that. All she knows is Butters was in the car and he sank like a stone. She goes back home and means to commit not alive, but has trouble writing her goodbye letter. Steve and Chris shows up in the nick of time and confesses what he did, believing the two can work through their issues. Only there's a teeny tiny little wop They don't have a son! Because Linda killed him! <laughs> there's nothing we can do about that! 
but I won't let you go to jail, I promise. Linda, please. Ah. Ah. And the whole time, the episode plays it out like this saccharine happy adventure. That just makes it all the more funnier and darker. So to make up for no longer having a son, Linda and Steve and Chris tell the authorities that Butters was abducted. When asked who the man was, Miss Stotch replied, some Puerto Rican guy. What did the kidnapper look like? Puerto Rican. Was he tall? Short? He was average Puerto Rican height. Oh, I'm Puerto Rican. So what is he, like 5'2"? I'm 5'2". Maybe you should call the frowning friends. They even meet up with other similar people who lost loved ones to some Puerto Rican guy. Hello, Gary. Great to see you. Chris and Linda, this is our good friend, Congressman Gary Condit. He also lost someone close to him and thinks it has something to do with the same Puerto Rican guy that hurt our kids. And I'll freely admit that I had no clue who that old dude was until I watched this episode and read a Wikipedia article. I know South Park isn't meant to be educational, but it really teaches me things. So to both of us, people all over town would be saying things like, Stop acting like victims and confess, you murdering murderers! Confess! LIAR! CONFESS! Okay, I know this has nothing to do with the video, but apparently Matt and Trey hate this part of the episode since evidence has come out that three out of four of these guys weren't guilty. Just fun fact. Butters returns, much to their joy, and Linda and Chris Steven, the murdering murderers, confess. Sort of. I went crazy and I drove my son into the lake to kill him. Uh, kill me? Jesus Christ! Damn, dude. Yay! Now you can go to Bennigan's and eat enough breadsticks until you forget the trauma. I'm sure Steve and Chris will be enjoying some himself. Except everything isn't alright in Happy Land. After this episode, the Stotch parents became known for a running gag where they would ground Butters for insane amounts of time for real or imagined reasons. Butters once got grounded simply because he misplaced something in the pantry. And since the pantry is in alphabetical order, Steven wrecked it and forced him to clean it up. If you keep putting food back under the wrong letter, it all goes wrong! Now you will reorganize this entire pantry and you will do it right! Yes. You do it right now or you're going to be grounded! You got that? Usually, Steven is the one doing the groundings, but Linda also goes along with it. Or they work as a team. Not now, Butters. Your father wants to have a talk with you in the kitchen. He is not happy. I have made my point pretty clear with Alador Blight, albeit before Clouds on the Horizon when we found out the full story, that enabling parents can be just as bad as the ones actually doing the abusing, since letting it happen is another form of abuse. And Linda herself isn't totally innocent either. In Jared Has AIDS, the boys use Butters and their newest scheme, having Butters gain a ton of weight and then say he lost it all eating at City Walk. When Butters obviously can't lose the weight in time, they decide the only logical solution Solution is to give him a DIY liposuction treatment. I don't know about this, fellas. Hey, you're the one that screwed us by not losing weight, Butters. Clearly, they don't realize Butters might be able to speed up the process if he just caught AIDS. They usually hang around on the corner of Fulton and Bleecker beneath the stop sign. This is unbelievable. How many times have we told you never to have self-performed liposuction surgery in our house? Four times, Mom. Well, I guess that wasn't enough. You get up to your room right now, mister. Steven finds them and grounds Butters, banning him from TV. Of course, parents have to work, so Butters is stuck at home, while Steven and Linda call him every hour on the hour. I've already got me in Dutch for getting fat, and then I got in double Dutch for having liposuction, and now you're asking me to be in triple Dutch? Uh-uh, I'll never be that Dutch. Which honestly isn't a good system. Butters can just watch TV and then shut it off when the phone rings. Why not send somebody over to check on him? At least nowadays they have nanny cams. So instead, the boys switch Butters out and have Cartman take his place so he can pretend to be Butters. And oh boy, does he run up their phone bill. I told you no television while you're grounded. Oh uh, gee whiz, I'm not watching television, Dad. I'm just laying around jacking it. Jacking it, jacking what? Linda's deserved a special recognition. Butters, your father called and said you made him very upset. Oh, you just wait till I get home, mister. I'll be waiting with bells on you, old horse banging skank. Then comes 5 p.m. Don't you, hi, mom and dad, us, you little punk. Oh, dad, you don't even know the trouble you're in, mister. Uh, what I do? What I do? Even during moments of brevity, when Linda and Steven seem to love Butters, they can still be a-holes. When Butters wrote the most vulgar yet moving novel known to man, they allow it to be published. But because of the contents, they grounded Butters. So he can't be on the Today Show. He has to telecast. And we also understand that your son is grounded, is that correct? 
Yes, we did have to ground him for the language in the novel, of course. I have to come right to my room after school. But we are very, very proud nonetheless. <sighs> Sucks, Butters. Rockefeller Center is lovely this time of year. I also wonder, did Trey and Matt's parents do this when they saw the first couple episodes of South Park? When Butters gets a girlfriend, or a girl he presumes to be his girlfriend, they seem to be delighted, but only because Steven won the bet. You see, I told you he wouldn't turn out gay. All right, you win. Then there's the times they try to help Butters. Carbon thinks he died, and the only other person who can see him is Butters. Which means the rest of the world believes Butters is knuckin' futz and talking to shadows. Butters, what on earth are you doing? But I'm like the, I'm like the kid in that movie. I'm seeing dead people. Dead people? Because, you know, he's not an imaginary precocious child who likes to play pretend. Linda and Steven take Butters to a doctor, who performs all manners of tests on him, which will stay with him for life. Well, after 14 hours of testing, I can say Butters is definitely suffering from aggravated repressed memory syndrome. The less said, the better. To be fair, there are times when Butters fights back against his parents, and they are as awesome as Kyle telling off Sheila. In Grounded Bindaloop, during what he believes to be a VR game, Butters tracks down his parents and gets his long overdue revenge. Oh! 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 Ah, I can almost feel his bowels on my fist! <laughs> True, sure, it isn't real, but it is amazeballs. During the Ungroundable, South Park Elementary has become obsessed with Twilight and has spawned a new clique of wannabe vampires. Speaking of somebody who did follow Twilight back in its heyday, and feels if it weren't for the implications, it could have been great. Why did y'all simp for Edward? True, sure, outside of Sparkles, the Stephanie Meyer take on vampires was unique, but Edward? He had the personality of a pet rock. At least Jacob felt like a character. Butters, not realizing the kids aren't actually vampires, begins to idolize them, since vampires can do whatever they want. I try to help and all I ever do is get hollered at. I'll bet vampires never get hollered at. So after a lengthy ceremony, Butters becomes one of them. And this means he's free from groundings. Steven. What has happened to our boy? He's become something, Linda. Something that we cannot ground. Point Butters. However, being a vampire means you must feed. And after Butters can't drink Cartman's blood, don't worry, dude, it was probably nothing more than Kool-Aid and cheese fizz, Butters tries to find a way to relieve himself of the curse. And it just so happens the goth kids want the same thing. They burn down the vampire's lair, the hot topic. Which is good, I mean, they're fun, but they're like hella expensive. And Butters is back to normal. He can be grounded. There's only one thing I care about. What's that, Dad? Well, would you mind telling me why there's rice a in my coffee? I did like the fact that Butters' transformation as a vampire was super antithetical to the other vampire kids. Despite dressing super dark, they were kind of nice and conscientious. Like, they didn't smoke or drink coffee, and they did try to tell Principal Victoria they wouldn't get out of hand. Butters did this. Dude. But don't worry, Linda and Steven still suck. During the episode Margarine, Butters fakes his death so he can go undercover and steal a cootie catcher. Linda and Steven don't understand, especially when they see Butters standing on the roof of a building. Look at all these people who've come out for you. Just come down now, son, and we promise we won't ground you for more than a couple weeks. No wonder he jumps. Now, I will give Linda this. At the funeral, she seemed devastated. No! Don't put him down there! Don't put him down there! Thankfully, Stephen hears about a pet cemetery, and they end up digging up the corpse to resurrect it. Strangely, for a show like this, nothing takes. But then Butters comes back perfectly fine. So out of gratitude, they lock him in the basement. It isn't right! Make it go away! Hello, son. Dad. He's starving, so instead of SpaghettiOs, he gets Rachel from Quality Curtains. Huh? There you go, son. Eat. What are we becoming? Because the last murder worked so well. And I cannot end the video without talking about one of Linda's worst moments. Stupid spoiled W word video playset. Her as Hilton comes to town to open a new store, and she catches the eye of Butters. Mr. Bagels, oh, I thought I'd lost you. 
Promise you'll never leave me. Butters, you're dating Paris Hilton? You are grounded, mister. Nice. If anything, you should be grounding Paris Hilton. She was, what, 23 when this episode came out? Oh, so she was like a year older than me. Paris thinks that Butters is a dog named Mr. Biggles and wants to buy him from Linda and Steven. They are reluctant. Oh, I want to take Mr. Biggles with me. With you where? To live with me forever and ever, you dumb broad. How much? Until they hear about money and they go full Mr. Krabs. But he's our son. I know, darling, but look, we have to think about the rest of the family. The rest of the fa You mean us? Yes, us, the rest of the family. Now, for what little you could give Linda, she does briefly object to it. Uh, sweetheart, isn't Paris Hilton worth a lot of money? Chris, she's more than twice Butter's age. But then Steven tells her it will benefit the rest of the family, meaning them. All right, Butters, tell you what. If you can raise the $250 million yourself, you can stay. <laughs> How am I supposed to make that kind of money? It's called working, young man. They neglect to see that Paris Hilton is the bluebeard of dead pets because she treats them so terribly that they have to take their own lives. Bye, sweetie, we love you. Butters, your mama loves you about as much as she loves that mole on her butt. And because Butters justifiably doesn't want to be killed by the stupidity of a stupid spoiled W word, he escapes. No, Mr. Biggles, no money. Oh, that troublemaking son of ours. Butters, Butters, you get back here or you are grounded, mister. I think this bees out trying to kill Butters. At least then you could justify that instance as Linda had a mental break. And when she came to her senses, she did honestly miss Butters. She just hated the idea of being in prison a little bit more. Here, Linda doesn't even care. And when Butters gets out of his contract at the end, thanks to Mr. Slave, he gets grounded. Uh, Butters, I hope you're happy. I'm a bad bear. I'm a very bad old bear. You're a grounded old bear. Then there's what Linda didn't do. During the current events, specials, her and Steven were portrayed as total germaphobes, who thinks that if you do anything but stay home, you will indeed get sick and die. It doesn't matter if you take precautions, wear a mask, or stay up to date on your courses. In the future specials, we find out Butters went insane and became an NFT dealer, changing his name to Victor Chouse and needing to be locked up in an insane asylum. Why? Well, after current events ended, Linda and Steven went to see a movie, but Butters was grounded, likely because of when he and the boys escaped the gym to go to build bear or the fact that he founded Little Cuties. And unfortunately, they forgot about him for 16 years. And Butters even seems to realize this. Guys, you have me confused. I think Butters was a torpy little loser kid whose parents didn't love him. My name's Vic, Vic Chaos. Oh, poor kid. Thankfully, this future is averted, but that doesn't mean that at one point they didn't do this. So altogether, that was Sheila and Linda. While many believe Sheila is the worst mom in South Park, I say that many overlook Linda. True, most of her bad decisions lie with Steven, but Linda lets it happen. And she's seen the darkness herself a few times. I told you, intent always plays a role. Sucks Satan couldn't just wave his magic wand and undo all of her messes. He did do it for Kenny and Sheila, 